Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Ben Sheen from Stratfor's editorial team. And with me today is Chief Science and Technology Analyst, Rebecca Keller, to talk about Hyperloop. Now, Rebecca, here at Stratfor, we take a close interest in new and emerging technologies and specifically their, their ability to change the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, what's Hyperloop and why is it important? So Hyperloop is an idea that Elon Musk, uh, the founder of SpaceX and Tesla, put out in 2013. He isn't working on it himself, technically, but he released an open source paper with this idea for high speed travel. So not like so we have high speed rail, we have airplanes, but this is a little bit different. If you think about those old bank tubes where you would send your checks up through the air tube, it's kind of like that, but on a whole other level. So basically you remove friction, you remove all of the things that require energy to travel, and you can go really, really fast without a whole lot of energy. So that sounds easy, right? Just put <laughs> in a tube like a bullet. Yes, absolutely. Right no, there's a lot of considerations. You're not moving a small tube with paper in it. You're moving a tube that has potentially people in it, commodities, goods. So how do you remove friction? So it's a tube that's under a near vacuum. So instead of acting like you're on ground where there's a lot of air resistance, it's like you're operating at really high altitudes. And then instead of moving on a track that would have friction, you're floating. So how do you make the train or the pod float? Um, you can use air, which is what Elon Musk proposed, or you can use magnetic levitation. So we have magnetic levitation with high-speed trains already. But uh, one of the companies is looking at what's called passive magnetic levitation, which would only be active when the train was moving, which would reduce the energy needed. So there's little things like that that you have to consider when putting these together. That being said, no one's close yet. Everyone's got dates like 2020, 2019 in their head as far as when they this, this new technology will be active, but there's still a lot of engineering technicalities to work out. Um, so why does it matter? As you've said, technology and geopolitics are intertwined. You can't have one without the other. And there's a couple ways that uh, Hyperloop could matter, should it be implemented in a reasonable time frame. In geopolitics, we look at constraints, and, and one of the constraints we look at is congestion and how infrastructure moves people and goods, and how it does that efficiently, how does that does that cheaply. Um, Hyperloop has the potential to remove a lot of the constraints of congestion. And, and you actually mentioned that in the analysis you wrote about how we evolved from uh, ocean-going transport to then going across distances mm -hmm. over land using rail to move heavy yeah. goods and people, and the advent of the automobile, but now, uh, we haven't really had a game-changing technology, you know, in the last century or so. So how is this? Well, I, I would stop you there. I would say one game-changing technology we've had in transport is the container ship, okay. um, because that allowed us to cheaply move um, consumer goods uh, across the globe and sort of buoyed globalization as we know it. That being said, we haven't had a increase in speed to the extent that Hyperloop would do that or one that does it at low cost, which is really the selling point that Elon Musk brought. Because when Elon Musk proposed the idea, it was um, in, in response to a proposed high-speed rail project in California that was going to be extremely high cost. So bringing the cost down is a big part of this project and a big goal of this project. That being said, um, there's a lot of unknown still. So what, whether that is actually achievable is still unknown. Another thing you mentioned as well is actually being able to travel from point A to point B very quickly is all well and good. But when you're looking specifically at the, the onboarding or the offloading and the actual uh, the infrastructure around, especially when the movement of goods from place to place, mm -hmm. that's where you really see congestion. So mm -hmm. actually, there are other problems that need to be solved around Hyperloop for it to be effective. Yeah, absolutely. So Hyperloop's not the only solution. Um, it, it's not a, a panacea. It's, it's not a panacea. It's not going to completely solve all of the problems. And honestly, there are, there are a couple ways you could use Hyperloop. You could use it to move goods or you could use it to move people. And it may solve one or the other, it may solve neither. Um, it still remains to be seen, but it is certainly an interesting technology to watch. Um, where we think it has the most potential is in short distance movement of goods, because that's the, the smallest scale, the most reasonable scale. And it's not moving people. There's a whole lot of other factors when you move people. There's the potential for motion sickness. There's the, the increased liability issues. So looking at ports where you've got to move a container, because um, with all the goods from the ship to the yard, to the truck, there's a lot of those stopping points that you're talking about. So Hyperloop has the potential to um, increase port efficiency. And we're seeing a lot of 
um, potential for increased port congestion, especially as container ships get larger and larger as the shipping industry struggles with consolidation and a, a, you know, a slow global growth and, and continues to try to find ways to survive in that environment. And you mentioned there are three main companies in North America that are looking at this technology, mm -hmm. but clearly there are global applications. And we've seen different countries around the world express an interest in Hyperloop. Mm -hmm. uh, what places or do you think are going to start developing this technology for the short distance high speed transfer that we're talking about? Right. So um, the United Arab Emirates, DP World, is a port operator there, is, is looking at, at using it in one of their ports. Um, Russia has expressed a lot of interest in using it to move goods as well. We could even see it at LA Long Beach. They're, they're doing a preliminary studies there as well. Fantastic. So the question I have, how soon can I get on it? Because I really want to, especially in Los Angeles, travel from A to B faster than I normally can. So right. are we talking years, decades? How long is it going to be? Um, certainly the 2020 proposal dates that a lot of the companies have put out there are probably rather optimistic, I would say. Um, we're probably looking at a decade or probably more before they're used on short term and, and even more before they're used for people. So you've got quite a wait. Okay, well, I look forward to the day when it does come around. Thanks. Becca, thank you so much for You're taking welcome. the time to explain this today. Thank you. For more on Hyperloop and science and technology, please continue to read stratfor.com.